Assalamu alaikum. <clears throat> so welcome to Physics 108. Life as you may have never seen before, a physics perspective. So my name is Mohammad Sabi Anwar. Uh, I'm a professor of physics. Uh, and I've always been fascinated about how physics can explain the human body, life, uh, the process of heredity, uh, evolution, DNA, etc. And when I was a youngster, perhaps of your age, I read a book by a famous physicist, Erwin Schrodinger. That book was published in the 1920s and it was titled, What is Life? Now here is a book on life written by one of the most celebrated physicists of all time, Schrodinger. Now that book sparked my interest in the subject. And even though I've never been uh, working uh, professionally as a researcher in the area of biophysics or the physics of life or the physics of the human body, still it captivates my interest by quite a bit. So I decided to come up with this 100 level course, a very basic curtain raiser to the idea of how physics can explain our human body and the different mysteries and processes and operations that define our human body. And of course, I can just take a very brief snapshot of the big picture, but I thought that this would be a useful, a fascinating course, and it might motivate some of our students uh, to work in this area. So this is just going to be a 100 level course. It's primarily going to be a lot of fun. I've also built some experiments and demonstrations that I will deploy inside the classroom. I might give you some kits to take home so that you can look at some of the physiological uh, processes that take place in our body uh, and measure them and observe them and contemplate about them and think about them in a deeper fashion. The, I'll try that the content and the scope of this course still remains at, at the 100 level. Uh, so I'm not going to overburden you with excessive workload. Uh, and I hope you'll walk away at the end of the 15th or 16th semester with some big lessons. And the biggest lesson that I think that you should take is motivating to apply physics in nooks and corners that are commonly not uh, discovered or explained in a, in a normal traditional physics curriculum. So I guess that the student body here in this classroom, they represent a diverse uh, background. Uh, and you can learn from this course to, what, to whatever your own personal desire is. A computer scientist might like to look at some of the aspects and write a computer code for the physiological signals that we measure. A physicist might look in deeper uh, detail about the fluid mechanics. An electrical engineer might like to model the circulatory system as a, as a control system. So this course has, may have some meaning for everyone. And I would like to make this into a personalized course so that you can take from this course whatever you desire suits you best. So as far as the grading scheme is concerned, I have three components. One are homeworks, uh, and I intend to give three or four homeworks during the semester. The second is a project uh, that will contribute towards 30% of the grade. And that project can come to life as you go through the course. For example, when I uh, share the outline of this course, you'll be you'll be able to tell that I've broken down this course into three components. And you can pick any one of those three components and come up with a problem relevant to the human body that is explicable, that can be explained by physics or mathematics. And then you present that work in the form of a project. And we'll have a final exam. 30% uh, of the grade will be for, for the final. And it's uh, <clears throat> so I have a website for this course, uh, which I've just uh, activated. Uh, I'll share the link 
on uh, uh, on LMS. All the course material will go on that particular website. Uh, the videos are hopefully going to be recorded. They are they are being recorded, and I'll upload them on YouTube as well so that you can look at them after the sessions are over. Uh, I expect that all of you will uh, follow an honor code. I'm not going to pursue anyone about teaching, about cheating or plagiarism. I assume that everyone is honest in this class. Uh, so this is an obligation which I impose upon myself uh, as well as any one of you. So I'm not going to pursue any, actively pursue any cheating because that just takes away my time. I assume that you'll all be fair to yourself and to your fellows uh, and will help others throughout the course in an intellectual fashion. <clears throat> so I've broken down this course into three components. One component I call my heart. I just need to get used to this thing as well. lies in physics. So in this, so this will be one third of the course. In this part, I'll talk about the physics of the circulatory system. And there will be two aspects that I'll cover. One is pressure, fluids, and the flow of fluids, and how we can model the circulatory system, the heart, the arteries, the capillaries, and the veins as a closed circuit in which a fluid is flowing, namely blood. And what physical principles on the first order govern this fluid flow? What is the resistance to this flow? How does the heart pump? What are the pressure ranges inside the circulatory system? And how do we measure this pressure? All right. Uh, I'll also model the circulatory system in terms of a thermodynamic uh, cycle in, in terms of uh, engine. So I look at both the mechanics and the fluid mechanics of the circulatory system, as well as the thermodynamics of the circulatory system. So this part will have two components. One is the fluid mechanics part, And the other is the energy and heat and work part. All right. So this will be one third of my course. My system of interest is the circulatory system. All right, the second part of my course would be, I've titled this as the spark of life. So in the spark of life, I'm really going to talk about how electricity pervades our body. And when I talk about our body, it's basically any mammalian body. Our focus is, also, is going to be on the human body. The examples that we'll take will be mostly from the human body. The homeworks might talk about a giraffe or a mouse or an elephant, but the mammalian body in general, how does electricity run in our body? And this is not the metaphorical uh, electricity. This is real electrical conduction, currents, charges per unit time measured in amperes, that are flowing in our body, both in our circulatory system, that's <clears throat> uh, why we have the ECG, electrocardiogram. There's a small battery in our hearts that is called the sinoatrial node, a pacemaker in colloquial language that generates an electrical impulse or an electric field that is measured uh, in an ECG experiment. Physicists like to call everything an experiment, by the way. So 
I'll talk about electricity in the circulatory system, but I'll also talk about nerve conduction. How do electrical impulses travel inside the nervous system? So my focus in this uh, second section would be on both the circulatory system with a focus on the sinoatrial node or the pacemaker as well as nerve conduction. And this nerve conduction, by the way, is a really, really, really important area these days, because if I were to pick up two or three areas in big science in the modern world that defy our capturing by, by, as a human endeavor that, that are so elusive, one of them is the brain itself. How does the brain work? So this is as big a mission as the space mission was in the 1970s. Some people say that the brain is the final frontier that we are yet to investigate. And all of this is, how does the brain work? How does the nervous system work? How, do, how does signaling take place in the nervous system? How do those signals communicate with other cells and so on? This is a central question to life itself. By the way, there's another course in the school that is parallel to this course, which is slightly more advanced. And that is a course on the introduction to computational neuroscience, which builds on some of these concepts and goes into much deeper detail, but it is a focus view of nerve impulses. And that's being taught by a very prominent uh, physicist and a mathematician, Dr. Farzada Farhui. All right, the third part, uh, I would like to focus on in this course is sensorial physics. In sensorial physics, I would like to talk about how do we see? So how do we see? How do we smell, sorry, smell? So these are the two senses that I have chosen for this particular course. And I've chosen sight for a special reason. I'm a quantum physicist, so I would like to bring in some quantum physics into this course as well. Both sight and smell, they are properly, properly described by quantum physics. And since by the end of this course, when we reach the latter third of this course, you might be doing modern physics as a core requisite to this course, you would have already gained some appreciation of quantum states, about the Schrodinger equation, how do states evolve. You might have gotten some felicity with Dirac notation. So I'll use quantum mechanics to describe how we smell. We smell because of quantum mechanical tunneling. And not us, but most birds who migrate from the cold, arid Siberian deserts to the warm lakes in Pakistan and in interior Sindh, they migrate because of a quantum mechanical principle in which a certain molecule inside their retina produces a pair of electrons, which are spins. And those spins evolve under the action of the Earth's magnetic field. And the bird can tell where it is on the Earth's, uh, on the terrestrial sphere by uh, looking at the population or the state of those electron spins. So th there's a tiny NMR experiment, a nuclear magnetic resonance experiment that is taking place in the bird's retina, describable by quantum mechanics, which makes these birds migrate in such a beautiful uniform fashion that they, they always follow the same path. The same could be said for, uh, say, fish that possibly move uh, in, in the ocean in, in certain seasons. So this is a big snapshot of what I intend to cover in this, in this course. So I'd be happy to take any questions about, about the course. Yes, please. Uh, 
Well, there are lots of uh, uh, lots of efforts to describe cell division and hered hereditary processes by quantum mechanical rules, and uh, as ascribing probabilities to the different kinds of pathways that uh, DNA can replicate into. But that was not a, an intended part of this course. By the way, the last lecture, one lecture in this course, I've I've reserved for the big stuff. You might have a guest speaker. I would like to title that lecture as complexity of life. So I'm still looking for a guest speaker for that big lecture. But to your question, I did not intend to cover this because I do not have, there's no concrete stuff out there that can explain everything in a masterful stroke. Okay, it's very speculative at the moment. Any more questions? So I just want to go through this uh, uh, classroom and see what backgrounds you come from. And so can you just introduce yourself, please? Just your name and your background, which. Still a freshman? Good. Very nice. What brings you to this course? You want to do an accounting of life itself? G. Yes, please. Right. I All right, so any more questions? So it seems that this is a pretty diverse cohort of students and that's good because I, this course will have some meaning and some excitement for everyone. And you can pick and choose the particular sections that you like and uh, try to walk away with them and delve deeper into those particular personalized aspects that we're going to cover. And your projects, for example, if I talk about pressure and fluid in the circulatory system, you might come up with a project about pressure and fluids in the air uh, respiratory system and so on, or, or the buildup of pressure, the intraocular pressure that exists inside the eye. So you can come up with projects which are offshoots of the work that we cover inside this class. All right, any more? Yes, please. I think we'll, we'll have group projects. Yes, any more questions about the logistics? The TA for this course is a very bright physics senior. His name is Hadi Masood. Unfortunately, he's not here today, but hopefully during the course, you'll get to know more about him. And since this is a new course, no one has taken this course before. And I haven't taken this course before. I haven't taught this course before. So it's an experiment in life itself. And by the way, don't be misled by life is much bigger than this physics or much bigger than this course itself. Life is so big. It's our existence. So just trying to be 
act like reductionist physicists here who are trying to reduce all the complexity, all the different kinds of stuff that life has to offer in a few formulas, in a few equations, in a few graspable systems that we can grapple with, we can play with. So we're making a toy out of the human body. It's not really a toy. A toy is something simple. It's made up of simple elements, simple members, like a machine made up of very simple members. So we're trying to reduce all the complexity and make our problem directly studyable. We want to study something. So we have to simplify all of this. And of course, we're not going to talk about the meaning of life or these bigger questions that are much, much bigger than ourselves, okay? All right, so the first thing that I would like to just quickly brush about is, is pressure. Now, how do we define pressure? It's force per unit area. So P equals F over A. If I have some surface of area A, and there is a uniform force acting on it. I can use this formula to find out the average pressure on this lamina, on this plate. Now, pressure is really important for the circulatory system because we're talking about a fluid here. And by fluid, what do we mean by fluid? Something, literally it means something that can flow. And it's a really, fluid mechanics is a really complicated subject, by the way. Uh, and it, it's the origins of this subject date from the time of Archimedes. And the most mathematically advanced textbooks that I've seen, and I, I'm always frightened of, are fluid mechanics textbooks. Because fluid flow is extremely, extremely complicated. But in the course, of course, we're going to simplify things. Uh, and we're going to... Uh, make things tractable. So when we talk about pressure, we need to understand that inside the circulatory system, the, the flow of blood, the heart is a pump, it's pumping blood throughout the body. Uh, we we'll look at a, a real diagram in the next class, but there's a pressure gradient along the circulatory system and that makes the blood flow. So pressure in normal terms has different units as well. So the SI units would be Newton per meter square. You could use Pascals. You could use atmospheres. You could use pounds per square inch. In cardiovascular descriptions, you generally use millimeters of mercury. So as you all know from your basic, uh, basic understanding of physics, if, you, I if I took a test tube, fill it completely with mercury right. and put this test tube downwards into a trough, put my hand on it and then release my hand. This mercury is going to spread out into, into the trough. And when equilibrium is achieved, the situation will look something like this. The mercury will go out into the trough. There will be vacuum here because this tube was initially completely filled and there is air pressure here. <clears throat> Let's call this air pressure the atmospheric pressure. Here there is vacuum. So if you're at the sea level, this column of mercury is going to ascend to a particular height. about 760 millimeters of mercury at sea level, right? So this is how you measure pressure. This is like a basic uh, manometer, which is measuring pressure. And at this particular level, the pressure is constant. So the pressure at a particular depth <clears throat> remains constant in a state of equilibrium. So generally when we talk about pressures inside the circulatory system, we are using these units 
millimeters of mercury or millimeters of water. 760 millimeters of mercury correspond to roughly 30 centimeters of water. And this height depends upon the density of the liquid and the acceleration due to gravity. So this is basic physics stuff. Generally, when you coat <clears throat> a pressure uh, measurement, there are two kinds of readings that you can coat. One is an absolute pressure, which is the real pressure. The other is the gauge pressure, which most measurement instruments record. And the absolute pressure is related to the gauge pressure through this formula. So a gauge pressure of zero would mean the object is at air, is at atmospheric pressure, ambient pressure. And you don't want to code. So you refer everything to the atmospheric pressure and code just the gauge pressure. So if you say that my blood pressure is <clears throat> say 100 millimeters of mercury at a particular point in the cardiac cycle, which we're going to talk about in detail in the next lecture, then that really means the gauge pressure. 100 millimeters of mercury is really the gauge pressure. The absolute pressure would be higher because you have to add the atmospheric pressure to that. So that would be 760 plus 100 millimeters of mercury. That would be the real absolute pressure. Okay. So you all know what pressure is. And a fluid, by the way, is generally a liquid or a gas. Generally. And fluids could be compressible. It could be incompressible. We make our lives easier by saying that the fluid is incompressible. We can't compress it. Okay, that will make our uh, discussion much, much, much slim, simpler. <coughs> Can anyone tell me what the <coughs> corresponding quantity is for solids? For, for solids, we generally use the term stress. Force per unit area is stress. And there's a corresponding strain as well. All right. Now, pressure is also governed by thermodynamics. So if you talk about a fluid, we all know the famous gas laws, PV equals NRT, right? I hope you all remember this. N is the number of moles, R is a gas constant, T is the absolute temperature. So this is a macroscopic form of, of the gas law, big form, number of moles. You could also come up with the microscopic form, a more statistical mechanical form, which is PV, capital N, number of molecules, Boltzmann constant T, okay? So these are, are just two, uh, two sides of the same coin. This is a macroscopic version of gas law. This is a microscopic version of the gas law where N, capital N is the number of molecules, all right? And this, applies to an ideal gas only, okay? And you know the Boyle's law, you know Charles' law, et cetera. And it's important for respiration, by the way. If you model the lung as, a, as an object that carries an ideal gas, when you are inhaling, the lungs dilate. When the lungs dilate, the volume goes up, the pressure goes down inside the lungs. Lower than the atmospheric pressure, you can breathe air in. And when you want to exhale, the diaphragm compresses the lungs, the lungs contract, volume goes down, the pressure goes up, and air is expunged or exhaled. All right, so you need to know these gas laws. This is all that you need to know about pressure. But we do recognize the fact that The pressure is basically due to interactions between molecules. And if I were to take a tank of water, we all need to understand this. So this is my tank of water. Excuse me.
so i draw two datum lines two lines would the pressure where would the pressure be higher at the lower point right so here the pressure would be higher so how 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 high would it be this right so if this distance is h this would be p1 plus the density of the liquid water so when you standing if there is a certain fluid inside your body the pressure would be higher just purely due to gravitation at the feet okay and this has implications for large animals as well I'm going to look at more examples in the homework but this is one source of pressure the the head the age of the fluid the depth of the fluid under the surface <clears throat> determines how high the pressure would be so that's why scuba driver scuba divers or fish that live in submarine environments the deeper they go in the higher pressure they have to sustain and it's the reverse for the atmosphere you go higher up the pressure goes down at the earth at the terrestrial surface the pressure is higher because there's a much larger head of air above you so the same thing applies to the atmosphere as well the other so one is pressure due to intermolecular interactions the other is pressure a source of pressure could be the head the depth of inside the fluid another source could be you could just have for example uh say some some object some container of some uh, a balloonic container in which the surface is stretchable and there's some fluid in it and you have your you have a measurement device here which senses the pressure and a small stimulus is applied here so this is an external stimulus the pressure will be transmitted here that's how you measure pulses so if you hold your artery here the radial artery when blood flows through it the pressure goes up and you sensing it all right so one cause of the pressure is purely due to intermolecular interactions the other is the head of the fluid head above the fluid the third is pressures could be transmitted by forces external stimuli all right so you apply a force here and you feel the pulse here or feel the pressure here so what really happens is you apply a force here the pressure goes goes up in this region and this is homogeneously distributed throughout the fluid because it's an incompressible compressible fluid and that pressure has to go up everywhere another way to look at this is <clears throat> you apply a force here the molecules here in this region tend to collide with another with a higher rate when they collide with other molecules that rate of collision spreads out throughout this uh, container and everywhere the collision rate goes up and the pressure goes up this by the way is also called the pascal's principle so another way of looking at the pascal's principle is that any pressure that is applied at one point is homogeneously distributed throughout the system and that's how you are able to measure pulses the blood that is coming in inside the pulse is an external force and you feel that pressure at another point <clears throat> any questions the pascal's principle says that if you have a fluid and you apply a pressure on a fluid at some location the pressure inside that medium is uniformly dispersed throughout the medium it goes up by the same amount so you measure the pressure here you hear here everywhere the pressure has gone up by the same amount and that's because of the origin of pressure the origin of pressure lies in intermolecular interactions okay so they are colliding with one another with a higher rate they're colliding with the walls of the container with a higher rate 
All right. So now we come to the most important part in this original discussion, and that pertains the flow of fluids. That's what fluids are known for, the flow, right? So let's talk about with this basic primer on pressure, just a refresher from basic high school physics. Let's talk about uh, flow of fluid. And I hope you've all taken calculus and you all know how to integrate, right? So let's talk about fluid flow. By the way, in, in the discussion that's going to follow, fluid flow is really important because we're talking about blood flowing through an artery, flowing through an arteriole, through a capillary, through a venule, through a vein, back into the heart, through the vena cava. And we're treating these, uh, these uh, blood vessels as pipes. Right? We're treating them as pipes. And we're making a gross assumption that the pipe is not elastic. And muscles have no role to play that surround the pipe. The pipe is not elastic. So when fluid comes in, the pipe does not uh, extend. It does not dilate. This is an oversimplification, but let's assume a good simplification, but let's assume that the pipes are elastic. And let's also assume that we have a closed system of pipes inside the circulatory system. Nothing bleeds. There's no bleeding anywhere. No ingress of blood from the circulatory system. No outgress. And let's also assume a steady velocity, steady speeds. We assume for the time being, for the time being, that there is no acceleration of, of, of the blood inside the blood drainage piping system. Now, just imagine how cruel a physicist can be or a mathematician can be, right? Explaining blood through a, such a mechanical process, elasticity and <laughs> and friction. We also introduce friction in, inside the blood. All right. So this is how most of physics works, unfortunately or fortunately. But it helps us understand how this, this maze of, which extends to thousands of kilometers, how this the entire system works. All right. So let me draw a pipe or a blood vessel. Length. L, radius capital R, all right, now if, if blood has to flow from the left to the right, there has to be some driver for the flow. Why there has to be a driver? Because there is some resistance to the blood flow. This is just like an electrical circuit. In electrical circuit, you have electrons everywhere in, in a wire, but the charge doesn't flow. There is no current unless you impose a battery on it. And the, what the role of the battery is, is that it overcomes electrical resistance. If you had no resistance in a material, you wouldn't need a battery. And that is true for a superconductor, for example. In a superconductor is a wire, piece of wire that has no resistance whatsoever. Once uh, in the yesteryears, if you put a battery around it and make a current flow, remove the battery, that current is going to last till ever. So exactly in this case, we have an analogy of the Ohm's law. We need some driver for the blood to flow from the left to the right. Okay, and that, could you tell me what that driver could be? What would make the blood flow from left to right if there has to be a driver or an engine or some mechanism that overcomes friction, resistance? What could make blood flow from left to right? Change in pressure, exactly. So if I were to have a pressure here, P1, and a pressure here, P2, I would need a gradient in the pressure, delta P, P1 minus P2, that will make the blood flow okay 
So this is the engine here. And of course, there has to be some friction. And we're going to derive what the friction is. And there has to be some dependence on the radius of this object, some dependence on the length of this object. A pressure gradient, like any other flow process, any other drift process, be it current, be it diffusion. In diffusion, the driver is the concentration gradient. In the electrical currents, the, the what is the gradient? Hmm? Battery, but what is voltage? A better word would be potential difference. The potential difference is the gradient. In fluid flow, which is an analogous process, there is this pressure gradient. And there's an analogy to the Ohm's law as well, Darcy's law and so on. In uh, there would be a diffusion equation as well. All right, so there is some driver here and that is pressure gradient. Meteorologists who predict the weather use this word very often. Uh, pressure gradients ca cause winds. So whenever there's a large pressure gradient, a big pressure difference per unit length, a big pressure difference in a small length, spatial and that will be a big pressure gradient that will cause faster winds. So here, a big pressure gradient over a smaller length will cause faster blood flows. More volume of the blood will pass from the heart to say the lower extremities of the body, okay? So it's exactly analogous. The physics is totally analogous. And that's the beauty of physics that there's a few equations and they can describe both climate systems, weather systems and the flow of blood in the body. Now, if I were to talk about, I introduce this variable Q, which is the flow rate. How much volume of blood flows from one point to another per unit time, <coughs> right? So if I were to take, say, I assume that my blood, I take a circular section in my blood. So let's do this in red. Right? So this is a circular section of my blood. I just focus my attention on section of the blood, section of the blood, right? The cross-sectional area is A. If I take this distance to be delta X, so if the blood is flowing at some rate, and in a unit time, it covers the distance of delta x. Then what is this q going to be equal to? Volume, flow rate, what is this volume per unit time going to be equal to? It's going to be A into delta x. This is the volume of this blood passing through a certain uh, cross section of the artery or blood vessel. And you divide this with the time, you will get the flow rate or you would like to make the time really small, you make A be X by DT, and this is AV. So you can find out the flow rate by looking at the cross-sectional area and the speed of, of the flow in meters per second, right? So by the way, now this is something really important. If I look at the, I hope you all know what the arteries are. And so if I look at the progression from the aorta, which is, I'll, I'll show a picture. I don't have a picture right now of the heart, but I'll show it in the next. Aorta is the big artery from which blood gushes out of the heart. Then we have the arteries. Then we have the capillaries. Then we have the veins. And then we have the big two vein vena cava that brings heart back into the left atrium. So the vena cava. One thing that you will immediately notice from this expression is suppose I have a pipe that is bringing in fluid and this branches off into two branches. It forks off into two branches and the area remains the same, just the same 
of each pipe. So this is A, this is A, and this also is A. And blood is coming in with the speed V. What's going to happen here? The pressure is all, there's always a pressure gradient that's causing the blood to flow. But what's going to happen to the speeds here? Will the speed here be the same as V? It's going to be half. Because now the overall area has gone up. It's branched off. The area is now double. The speed has to go. It has to halve. That's be why. That's because the blood cannot be. We assume that the blood is not accumulating anywhere. It's not clogging the arteries. It's not plugging the flow. The blood is a steady flow. It's a laminar steady flow. Whatever comes in has to go out. There is no clogging or clotting of blood anywhere inside the artery. There is no cholesterol here, no plaque deposited in these arteries that can clog the blood. So the speed that comes in here has now reduced to half. And that's the pattern that we observe over here. If you, now I have a table here. So if I just <clears throat> note down the cross-sectional area, three centimeters square, 100 centimeters square, 900 centimeters square, 200 centimeters square, 18 centimeters square. Now the aorta, aorta is a big artery. The arteries are small, but there are so many of them. So you exactly have this branching of the aorta into many, many, many arteries. And you add up all their areas, it's about 100 centimeters square. At the capillary level, it goes to about 1,000 centimeters square, even though the capillary is just the size of a red blood cell on the order of microns. Each capillary is very small, but overall the expanse, this area is so large, almost a thousand centimeters square. So now if you plug in, this is, this is a kind of a, a continuity equation. That is A, I, V, I in some section, I of this circuit is some constant. This is like a continuity equation, right? So you have to keep this product the same. So if the blood is flowing here at about 30 centimeters per second, which it does, a very large speed, it's going to drop to about one centimeter per second here and about uh, point 0.1 centimeter per second here. Here it's going to go to 0.5 centimeter per second. And here it's, just going to be about five centimeters per second, right? So this is how blood flows, the speed of the blood as it goes through the various parts of the circulatory system. The speed is very high in the aorta because the, the cross-section area is really small, even though the aorta itself individually is big. But when it reaches the capillaries, the speed becomes so sluggish, one millimeter in a second. So sluggish, but that's good because it gives time for gaseous exchange. The oxygen that this good blood, the oxygenated blood is carrying has sufficient time to cross the capillaries and go into the cells so that the cells can, uh, can, can do their meta metabolism. So sufficient time is available for gaseous exchange. All right, yes, please. So if I relax this, this condition, then the factors will change. This is a major departure from the assumption that we've made. These capillaries are not elastic. In fact, there's a kind of a plugged flow, peristaltic flow in which blood comes into the vessel, the muscle that surrounds the vessel dilates, the capillary, the uh, blood vessel expands, and then the muscles contract and they push the blood forward. So, but this is a good first order approximation. Now, what I would like to do is before I finish off this class, I would like to set the stage for the next lecture. I'll talk about blood pressure and bring a real device that measures blood pressure 
and show what the signal looks like. So we're not going to do a systolic and diastolic measurement, the high blood pressure. We are actually going to look at the oscillations of the artery. We're actually going to look at what the pressure temporally looks like. But before I finish off this lecture, some food for thought for the next lecture. In a fluid, in a pipe, for example, and we have to derive an equation. So there's going to be some calculus at the start of the next lecture. So if I have a pipe and a fluid is flowing, and I'm assuming laminar flow, steady laminar flow, no turbulence, and I'm assuming a condition that is called the no slip condition. If I look at the wave front of the fluid, the head of the fluid, the leading edge of the fluid, under these simplified conditions, the fluid is, this is what the fluid profile looks like. This is my fluid. It's going from left to right. The head of the, the leading edge of this fluid, the, wa the water front has a parabolic shape. And we have to drive, derive why is this parabolic, right? The, at the edge, at the boundaries, the fluid does not move in steady state. It does not move. And this water front is parabolic. We have to derive why it is parabolic. If I were to plot the velocity vector on this water front, the velocity vector is going to look like this. It's large and to the right here, it's smaller, even smaller here, even smaller here, even smaller here. So this profile V as a function of R, where R is this variable, looks like a parabola. It's proportional to R square. Now with the help of this, we need to motivate ourselves why this is the case. And when we are able to this, we'll be able to find out the Ohm's law for blood flow inside the blood vessels. We know that the potential difference is the pressure gradient. We need to derive what the friction is, what is the analog to the resistance, and what is that constant of proportionality, the resistance that we generally, uh, and the flow is Q. How much is the cardiac output? How much blood is flowing from one point to another because our body parts require a certain volume of blood because they require a certain volume of oxygen. So we're going to put everything together and find out the Ohm's law, Ohm's law for blood flow. We'll invoke some calculus, some basic calculus to, de to derive all of this. All right, so any questions for today's class? Yes, please. None other but the heart. It's the heart. The heart is a pump. And what is a pump? A pump creates a pressure gradient from one point with respect to another. That's how we define a mechanical pump. The heart is a mechanical pump that is creating this pressure gradient. So when the left ventricle contracts, it's creating a region of high pressure compared to where you would like to compare to where the capillaries are. That pressure gradient is making the blood flow. And the origin of that pumping, these are muscles in the left ventricle and the right ventricle that have a certain strength. The muscles derive their nourishment from a process of metabolism. And it's an electrical origin, the sinoatrial node, the pacemaker that is triggering the pulse to contract, uh, the muscles to contract. So it's a mechanical pump whose origin lies in an, uh, in an electrical signal. All right. Any more questions? Yes, please. It's only on the fluid. All right, inshallah, see you in the next class. Thank you very much.